And good evening, everybody. I'm Aaron Gilchrist in for Tom Yamas. Tonight, the death toll in western New York already passing the blizzard of 1977. It's on track to become Erie County's worst storm on record. Countless cars and trucks seen abandoned on roads in whiteout conditions. Parts of the region still under a travel ban as first responders struggle to reach stranded residents. Local agencies even putting out emergency calls for snowmobiles. Nearly a foot of snow falling again today as some worry they will run out of food. But many in what's called the city of good neighbors coming together to help each other. One family taking refuge in a Target store over the Christmas holiday with employees turning that store into a makeshift shelter. We'll speak with that mom about that unforgettable experience. At the same time, western New York is digging out much of the country still facing freezing temperatures after days of unrelenting cold. We begin with Emily Aketa, who leads us off tonight. Tonight, the city of Buffalo buried and unrecognizable as the death toll from a devastating deluge of fierce winds and heavy snow continues to rise. Officials reporting 27 deaths in Erie County, New York. Victims discovered in cars and snow banks after the blistering blizzard brought even first responders to a standstill. Some residents dying from exposure, others lack of heat and cardiac events after working to clear snow. We have been through a lot of wars together. And this blizzard is the one for the ages. Certainly it is the blizzard of the century. The crisis far from over, as Dave McKinsley from NBC station WGRZ tells us. One of the biggest problems remains clogged streets and roadways where cars were left abandoned during the height of the storm, making it impossible for plows and even emergency equipment to get down them. Adding insult to injury, evidence of looting caught on camera. I don't know how these people can even live with themselves. The weekend's widespread storm claimed dozens more lives across the country. The Tisdale family was lucky to survive. It could have been us. Facing problems with power at home, the family tried to seek warmth at a nearby hotel, but within minutes on the road, got caught in whiteout conditions. I've I seen the looks on my kids' faces, and I just, I just felt so helpless at that moment. Like, I felt very helpless. Thankfully, they were rescued by firefighters who welcomed the family of six into their firehouse for three days, including Christmas morning. While conditions are beginning to ease, snow is still falling in Buffalo, a city already blanketed in four feet. Up to 8 to 12 inches is expected in the most persistent band area. This is not helpful. And Emily Aketa joins us now from Central Park in New York City. Uh, Emily, we heard you in your report there that Buffalo is still getting hammered by snowfall tonight. How long before these weather nightmares improve? That's right. As you heard there, between today and tomorrow, officials say that parts of Buffalo could get up to another foot of snow, which is really hampering ongoing and urgent search and rescue missions happening as we speak. 400 National Guardsmen on the ground today, but conditions will be improving there in the coming days with warming temperatures on the way for much of the country. Aaron. Emily Aketa for us tonight. Emily, thank you. For more on Buffalo's historic blizzard, we're joined now by Elizabeth Carey from AAA Western and Central New York. Elizabeth, we appreciate you coming outside and talking to us here. Uh, we, we know that the, the death toll is growing from this storm. There are more people who've been found in cars, as I understand it. What's your understanding of, of why emergency services couldn't reach some of these folks? What happened there? Yeah, it was literally complete gridlock. What happened is uh, it started with the blizzard conditions. And, you know, we told everyone not to go out on the roads and have an emergency kit if you do go out. But some vehicles, for whatever reasons, still tried to go out on the snow. And what happened is they're complete whiteouts. So you couldn't see two feet in front of you. You were forced to pull over on the side or stop the vehicle. And then heavy snow came, lake effect snow, and the vehicles became stuck on these roadways. Yeah, just really tough for so many folks there. This, this storm, as we mentioned, is Buffalo's worst in, what, 45 years. We hear people talk about the blizzard of 77. Uh, this was not just another Buffalo snowstorm like you see uh, maybe every winter even. Why are we seeing such devastation, do you think, in that area this time around? Do you think people just underestimated how severe this was going to be? Well, it was forecasted and it hit spot on just mm. like it was supposed to. And even by Buffalo standards, this was a really difficult storm uh, to really compete with. What happened is it was those high winds, blizzard conditions, and the combination with that heavy lake effect snow also taking place on a holiday weekend when a lot of people wanted to be out shopping or trying to get to be with their family. So it really just was a terrible, perfect scenario. 
We know your AAA teams are, are at work, trying to be at work in that area. Emergency crews from other agencies are still working to, to help with search and rescue operations. There's still that driving ban in place in some parts of Erie County. What's the recovery effort looking like? What's it going to look like moving forward to try to get Buffalo back on its feet, back to normal? Yes, yeah, some progress was made today, but there's a lot that needs to be done. Uh, you know, it's unbelievable to think that a plows, heavy machinery, buffalo fire trucks could not compete with the snow and couldn't yeah. get down the roads. It, absolutely, the roads were impassable. So it's still an emergency operation that's underway right now. They are trying to make sure they're clearing the roads for emergency responders. They want to get the doctors and nurses to the hospital to relieve the workers that have been working for several days with no relief. In the meantime, trying to rescue anyone else who might need medical attention or maybe stranded outside. Well, all their efforts are very much appreciated, I know, by the folks who, who need the help and the folks who live there in, in your community. We appreciate you. Uh, be safe there. Elizabeth Carey from AAA, Western and Central New York. Thanks. Well, while the blizzard still leaves people across the region stranded, there are also stories of complete strangers coming together trying to get through the worst of the storm. Take a look at uh, all these people. These are folks stuck at a Target store. They're gathering at the Starbucks there for some something warm to drink. They didn't have many places to go either. You look outside, you see the snow drifts blocking the doors there. And even if they could get outside, take a look at the parking lot here. If you look closely enough, you can see some of the cars sticking out of the snow off in the distance. Joining us now is Jessica Sitneski. She found safety in that Target store with her boyfriend and two kids. Jessica, uh, we're, we're happy to be talking to you tonight. Tell us about your, your decision to seek shelter in that Target and the, and the moment you realized you were going to be there for a while. Uh, thanks for having me and sharing our Target story. Um, we actually started nowhere near Target. We mm. had to make our way using our maps on our phone to get to the plaza. We actually tried a local grocery store and they wouldn't let us in, unfortunately. And um, we kind of sat in the car for a little bit, just, you know, hanging on tight, wondering if it was gonna pass by. And I had my kids with me. So the first thing in my mind was I need to find shelter. Um, Target was there, we knocked. <laughs> We knocked on the door and they let us in and the experience there was great. I'm grateful for them, the employees and everybody there that was with us. Um, we knew we were going to be there for a little bit after yeah. like five o'clock on Friday. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you know, I can only imagine how how scary that had to be oh, for you and for your kids. Uh, you know, at first when you're in the car and then you have to make that move or try to find some place that will open the door for you. Fortunately, like you said, the target was there. I understand you had pretty much every resource to make yourself comfortable as you might find in a target. What was it like, you know, being in there, building beds with the kids and, and everybody else who was stuck in there at the same time as you? Oh, it was a, it was an experience. My kids will never forget it. Um, they gave us air mattresses. We created our little homes. Everybody had little separate areas, so they felt comfortable, you know, because we are, at the end of the day, still all strangers, and mm -hmm. everybody wanted to be kept comfy in their own little area. Um, I bought my kids, you know, crayons and markers, and my son got a Lego set, and they were looking at books, so they kept themselves busy. They had no problem <laughs> at all, um, but it was an experience. Everybody got to know each other. We heard their so stories, um, some why they ended up there, and, you know, like, I cannot say but everybody came together at the end of the day. You know, all through Friday and Saturday, more and more people kept just showing up, uh -huh. and everybody lent a helping hand, and uh, someone walked in. We threw them blankets and heaters and hot cocoa from Starbucks with coffee. I mean, everybody really, really came together at that moment, everybody at that store. Yeah, and, and I think we have a photo we can put up of, of, of everybody who, who had to take refuge in the Starbucks there. A good number of the folks uh, posing for a picture there. I, I, did you make some lifelong friends there? I know you said you, you shared stories. Do you feel like uh, so you're going to meet some of those folks again? I have to go back to Target because my son's Lego set is there in blankets. Um, oh. And I have some Facebook friends now for sure. <laughs> Well, I can. I know, like I said, that this must have been a little bit of a scary experience. I'm glad that it turned out well for you and for your your, your your family and for everybody else who was in the store there. Uh, your community has a lot more work to do to, to get through this storm, so I, I appreciate you making time for us. And uh, I, I see the Bills hat. I see you. I understand. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. We appreciate your time. Thank you for sharing our story. 
Well, now we want to turn to the travel chaos that's still unfolding across the country at this hour. Today alone, the U.S. saw more than 6,000 flights delayed and more than 3,000 flights canceled. It was a similar story on Christmas Day, with one out of every three flights delayed at Chicago's O'Hare Airport. NBC's Shaquille Brewster is there now with the latest. The worst of the deadly storm may have passed, but millions still can't wake up from a travel nightmare. At Chicago's O'Hare Airport, the ripple effect of bad weather and too much demand creating a sea of humanity. It looks like a zoo. It's a complete and utter zoo chaos. It's crazy. But it's not just the Windy City. Airports from coast to coast utterly overwhelmed. With a staggering 62,000 flight cancellations and delays since Thursday, the holiday mayhem trapping countless passengers. We have just been stuck for, what, a good 18 hours now? In Philly, travelers stuck at the airport overnight. I don't know what to do. The only flights are way too expensive and we're stuck. In Houston and Tampa, delayed luggage as far as the eye could see. Our very own Stephen Romo stuck in St. Louis sharing this video. The ticket counter line for Southwest, endless. My husband and I trying to get back to New York City from St. Louis. Southwest abruptly canceled our flight this morning without giving us a reason. The airline telling him he won't get out until Friday. But the trouble hasn't just been cancellations and delays. And we have a report of a possible fire at 8 Saturday at New York's JFK Airport, an entire JetBlue flight forced to evacuate on the tarmac. The FAA reporting a cell phone went up in smoke, leaving seven passengers with minor injuries. Back here at O'Hare, frustrated travelers trying to endure the post-holiday hell. This is chaos. We just came up the elevator and I was very surprised. <laughs> what got you so surprised? All the people. There's like a, there's a lot of people here at the airport today. I'm very frustrated and upset. <laughs> and I got some strong words I can't say for TV about it. However, some refuse to lose hope. You're getting to Jamaica. Yeah, we're getting there. Today, one way or another, we're getting there. And Shaq joins us now from Chicago. Shaq, you mentioned there that Southwest Airlines took an especially hard hit today, canceling, what, 67% of the flights. What's the airline telling customers at this point? Well, Aaron, they're admitting that it is unacceptable. I mean, let's just underscore that. That means two out of every three Southwest flights have been canceled. So tonight they're apologizing and releasing this statement. Let's put it up on the screen. They explain that we're working with safety at the forefront to urgently address wide-scale disruption by rebalancing the airline and repositioning crews and our fleet, ultimately to best serve all who plan to travel with us. One thing to remember with this, Aaron, is that when flights are canceled, Many of those passengers are then rebooked. The airlines are also dealing with the existing travel schedule that we know is elevated during the holiday season. So it will likely take a few days for folks to really be back on track if they're still planning to travel. Yeah, I know you're keeping an eye on the roads too, Shaq. What's the, the, the best advice for people who choose to drive back home and, and may now face that holiday traffic on the roads? Well, some advice and a little bit of a warning from travel experts. They're calling tomorrow the worst travel day of the year. That's when they're expecting, expecting the most congestion. They also say Wednesday is also going to be busy. The tips that you're hearing from experts is that if you are going to hit the roads later this week, you want to travel either before 2 p.m. or after 8 p.m. That is when you'll avoid most of that traffic. But I think bottom line, whether you're looking at the roads or you're going to an airport and taking that flight, be ready to be patient. Patient indeed. Shaquille Brewster for us in Chicago tonight. Shaq, thanks. Well, the freezing temperatures also adding to mounting problems at the U.S.-Mexico border. El Paso's convention center turned into a makeshift refuge for those desperately seeking help. A record number of migrants crossing the border this year and many in recent days unprepared for the cold. NBC's Sam Brock has that story from Texas. Tonight, El Paso overwhelmed with migrants battling bureaucracy and bone-chilling cold. Venezuelan Luis Oler says he's not accustomed to temperatures in the 20s. Many staying warm in churches over Christmas, connected through song, but also pain. Others were left outside, like this little boy with just a few blankets. We've come for a better life, he said. 
At this El Paso Convention Center, there's a thousand beds inside. Refuge for some, but only for those migrants who have the proper paperwork. The chaos against the backdrop of an unprecedented number of undocumented immigrant crossings at the southwest border in fiscal year 2022, 2.76 million, putting a massive burden on states like Texas. Buses leaving there and dropping families off in freezing temperatures outside Vice President Kamala Harris's D.C. home on Christmas Eve. The White House calling it a shameful stunt, a spokesperson for Governor Abbott countering the migrants had agreed to go. With the COVID era Title 42 allowing for the expulsion of many asylum seekers still in limbo, charities are picking up migrants along the southern border and taking them to shelters across the country. Shelters already stretched thin and right now with no solutions in sight. Sam Brock reporting there. We turn now to the investigation into a series of attacks on electrical power stations in Washington state. Officials say it may be the latest in a string of attacks on the nation's power grid. Here's NBC's Tom Costello. It happened early Christmas morning. Three power substations in the Tacoma area targeted and vandalized. Another on Christmas night. Arriving officers found blue flames, the perimeter fence cut. In all 14,000 people left without power, Amanda Clark lost electricity and her well water. It's scary in our small little community that something like that would happen. We're going to be investigating to see if this was coordinated by a specific group or people. The FBI issued a warning this month after power companies in Oregon and southern Washington were attacked using hand tools, arson, firearms and metal chains, possibly in response to an online call for attacks on critical infrastructure. In North Carolina, substations were attacked with gunfire, knocking out power to 45,000 homes and businesses. A Homeland Security terrorism advisory warned in November that domestic actors and foreign terrorist organizations maintain a visible presence online to motivate supporters to conduct attacks in the homeland. The FBI seems concerned that domestic terrorism is encouraging this online. What's the motivation? They're looking for chaos and destabilization because they believe the government is oppressive. Um, they believe the government is, is what keeps everything going and they don't like the way things are going. And Tom joins us now from Washington. Tom, how concerned are officials in Homeland Security about the electric grid now? Well, they are concerned about it. I mean, it appears that this is being targeted by these domestic extremists who are motivated by election anger, the capital insurrection, Nazi ideology, social political issues, and they're being encouraged and ramped up online to take this kind of action. Are there any clues at this point, Tom, about what the, the motivation is for attacking a power station outside yeah. of what you just sort of went through? I asked the same thing. Why? What's the motivation for attacking a power station? Because you're just essentially reducing or taking out the power for your own neighbors. Yeah. The answer is apparently they want to sow chaos. Their view of this is the more that they can sow chaos, that would create social upheaval. People would grab their guns and take up arms against the government. That's their view. Uh, and Homeland Security and the FBI are very concerned because they're feeding on each other online and creating this feeding frenzy, and then they go out and launch these attacks. Tom Costello in D.C. for us tonight. Tom, thank you. Next tonight in Maryland, a scary moment when a plane, a small plane, crashed into a freezing creek. Witnesses near the scene jumping into action to save the pilot. NBC's Stephanie Gosk has more. It was a desperate scene this morning in Maryland. A small plane crash landed into an icy creek. We knew he was in trouble. And so we ran out to the patio and we saw the plane go down and ditch into the creek. The pilot survived but was not out of harm's way. The plane was sinking and the water was frigid. The creek is completely frozen over. The water temperature is low 40s. So he's probably got 30, maybe 60 minutes or so before hypothermia sets in. John Deline, a former captain in the U.S. Navy, and his son, a U.S. Marine, grabbed the family's kayaks. I attribute it to sort of my military background. We just kind of went into action. You say your military training kicked in. What does that mean? I knew that there was a man overboard port side. What do we need to do to get this uh, individual out of the water as quickly as possible? You actually pulled him out of the water kind of onto the kayak. Is that what happened? Yeah, yeah. I asked him to release from the plane the tail. That's all that was left for him to grab to and got it and, and yanked him onto the kayak. Emergency crews arrived and brought the pilot to shore with non-life-threatening injuries. 
kind of a blessing on Christmas to be able to help someone like that who knows you could have ended badly. The plane is lost, but the lucky pilot has two new quick-thinking, seafaring friends and quite a story to tell. Stephanie Gosk, NBC News. We are coming through the height of the holiday season now, and what is looking like a new increase of coronavirus cases? COVID hospital admissions are up nationwide. The number of people in the ICU is up nearly 11% in the past two weeks. Deaths are up 15% in that same period, with more than 400 people dying every day. At the same time, flu and RSV numbers have dipped two weeks straight. The CDC reporting this could be the peak of the season. Now, that does not mean that Americans are in the clear of the triple-demic. Flu rates are still higher than average in most of the country. You take a look at the map here. More than 40 states and Washington, D.C. still have high or very high flu activity. Let's bring in Dr. Uche Blackstock now to help us understand what's happening here. She's the founder and CEO of Advancing Health Equity and an MSNBC contributor. Dr. Blackstock, we appreciate you being here. Uh, you, you know, we're seeing some viruses surge now. We're seeing others wane at the same time. What's your understanding of why some viruses are now spreading more than others? Hi, Aaron. Thank you so much for having me. So what I think is really important for everyone to understand is every virus has its own biology, its own way of behaving. Since RSV and flu season started earlier than normal, we're probably seeing uh, you know, decline now. Flu, however, can be kind of unpredictable, so we may see an increase again. But RSV cases likely will continue to decline. COVID, on the other hand, this is the perfect storm for an increasing cases. The cold weather, people are indoors, people are not masking. Um, and so they're not following those COVID precautions that we used to do so well before. And that's why we're seeing this increase combined with variants that are more immune evasive. We're seeing more infections. So in your view and, and in your work, are, are, are we in a new COVID wave right now? And if so, what does that mean in a world where a lot of people think, you know, we're, we're post-pandemic now? Right. So, yes, I would definitely say that. You know, we've seen a steady increase in cases. We're seeing more hospitalizations and deaths. And I think for people to keep in mind is that the booster rate is still quite low. There are so many people that are still eligible to get their boosters and only a mere fraction have actually gotten it. We know from a recent CDC study that if you are vaxxed and boosted, especially with the most recent bivalent booster, that protects you against the worst outcomes of COVID, hospitalizations and death. So that's something that people, if you have not gotten boosted, should seriously consider. You mentioned deaths there. Do you have an idea of why we're seeing more COVID deaths now than we were, say, even a month ago? Well, I, I think it's that combination. I think that we're, you know we have waning immunity. People who were vaccinated but still haven't gotten boosted. We also have those Omicron variants that are around right now that are more immune evasive. And then people are spending more time indoors. So we're having an increase in cases, which leads to an increase in hospitalizations and then increase in death, especially among people who have chronic medical problems immunocompromised or are elderly, they really need multiple layers of protection. It's just that perfect storm we're starting to see in so many places now. I, I want to ask you, too, just as we think about this tridemic, the triple-demic, as people have been calling it, flu, COVID, RSV, all have these respiratory symptoms that uh, we, we have some yeah. understanding of. But how do you tell these symptoms apart? How do you tell the, the viruses apart without a test? You know what? So there are charts out there, and the charts will show you there's a lot of overlap in mm -hmm. symptoms. But I will say this. So RSV, especially in children, can cause difficulty breathing and wheezing symptoms, almost like asthma. That can also impact elderly in the same way. So you'll hear that wheezing. That's very characteristic of RSV. With flu, you get more body aches, malaise, tiredness, and fever. And with COVID, we still are seeing that loss of taste and smell that is specific to COVID. And we don't really see that with other viruses. Other than that, I would say it's very difficult to distinguish the viruses from each other. And so that's why it's so important to do those rapid home tests or go to the closest urgent care and get an RSV or flu test. Dr. Uche Blackstock tonight, thank you so much. Now to a strange development in the unsolved murders of four University of Idaho students. A professor at the school is now suing a TikTok creator for defamation. She says that creator has accused her of being involved in the killings. 
The lawsuit says the creator has published dozens of videos tarnishing the professor's reputation. NBC's Steve Patterson has more. Tonight, a TikTok creator facing a defamation lawsuit surrounding the unsolved murders in Moscow, Idaho. Oh my God. Killer Rebecca is suing me. Rebecca Schofield, a University of Idaho professor, is suing TikTok creator Ashley Gillard. I'm not stopping, so let's just start there. Alleging Gillard has wrongfully accused her of ordering the killings of four University of Idaho students last month. When Rebecca Schofield, the one who murdered the four Idaho college students, see my videos. Gillard, who claims to solve high-profile murders by using tarot cards and by performing other readings, started to post videos naming the professor as the killer in late November. But authorities have yet to name any suspects in the case. The lawsuit denies all the allegations, says Schofield was not in the state at the time of the murders, and that she did not know any of the victims. Professor Schofield doesn't have to solve the mystery of who killed these students. Instead, she only has to prove that she did not. Modern technology makes it relatively easy to track exactly where she was on the night of the murders. The lawsuit highlights the potentially harmful speculation around the quadruple homicide. I spoke with Moscow Police Chief James Fry last week. I think rumors always hurt us um, in an investigation, but it's our job to go back and utilize our resources and to continue to um, vet those and make sure that uh, all that information um, is still cataloged so that we have it. They have a rumor control section of their website around this case, telling us they are aware of the lawsuit, but they are not commenting further at this time. In over 80 TikToks on the topic, Gillard has named Schofield as a co-killer and has accused her of hiring another student to execute the murders. Amassing millions of views and likes, Schofield's lawyer told us she sent two cease and desist letters asking the creator to take down her videos. If they really think I'm making false statements, they will need to file actual legal documents in a federal court. Schofield's lawyer saying this lawsuit became necessary to protect Professor Schofield's safety and her reputation. Since filing the lawsuit, Gillard has continued to post to TikTok. Now Rebecca is going to be added to the list of regretful people. Alleging Schofield's involvement in the tragic killings. Despite defamation being a difficult suit to win, if the allegations in the complaint are true, our legal expert believes Schofield has a good chance. The odds that Professor Schofield will win this lawsuit are 99 Point nine 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 percent. And Steve Patterson joins us now from Los Angeles. So, Steve, what more do we know about the burden of proof for a defamation case like this? Yeah, look, Aaron, our legal expert tells us even if only five people had seen that TikTok, that's more than enough eyes to bring a defamation case. In fact, as long as just one other person sees the alleged defamatory comment, it meets the standard. And this, of course, has a far wider reach than that. The lawsuit does not list a dollar amount for damages being sought, just compensatory and punitive to be proved at trial along with attorney fees. We also reached out to TikTok, by the way, for comment. They haven't responded yet. Aaron. Steve Patterson at our L.A. Bureau tonight. Steve, thank you. We're back now with fresh controversy surrounding Whoopi Goldberg. It's spilling over from comments she made almost a year ago saying the Holocaust was not about race. She was widely condemned then and apologized, but she just made similar comments again in a new interview. NBC's Nayela Charles has the story. Tonight, Whoopi Goldberg making controversial comments again, reiterating statements from earlier this year that the Holocaust wasn't about race. The Sunday Times of London quoted Goldberg as saying the Holocaust, quote, wasn't originally about race. Also saying, quote, they did that to black people too, but it doesn't change the fact that you could not tell a Jew on a street. You could find me. You couldn't find them. That was the point I was making. The Times said when the reporter reminded Goldberg that Nazis identified Jews as a race, she rebutted, the oppressor is telling you what you are. Why are you believing them? They're Nazis. The article already invoking backlash and deja vu from some critics on social media, including from a Holocaust survivor and author who said Goldberg continues to use the Holocaust as her punching bag. Back in January, Goldberg was responding to reports of a school banning a graphic novel about the Holocaust when she said this on The View. The Holocaust isn't about race. No. No. It's well, not about maybe race. Maybe a city. It is. Well, it's no, it's about a, a different it's, race. But it's, it's not about race. It's not about well, race. What is it about? Because you, it's about man's inhumanity to man. And double down on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert. I was saying you can't call this racism. This was evil. 
Mm -hmm. This wasn't this wasn't based on the skin. You couldn't tell who was Jewish. After public pressure, she apologized. But it is indeed about race because Hitler and the Nazis considered Jews to be an inferior race. The View had the Anti-Defamation League on the show to explain the history of persecution the Jewish people have faced. But the Anti-Defamation League did not call for Goldberg to be canceled. I don't believe in cancel culture. I like the phrase that, that my friend Nick Cannon uses. We need council culture. You know, in the Jewish faith, Don, we have a concept called shuva. And shuva means redemption. It means all of us have the power to admit when we do wrong, and to commit to doing better. But ABC still suspended her for two weeks. Now ABC's next move is unclear after these latest comments published on Christmas Eve. The company has yet to respond for comment. Tonight, Stand With Us, an Israel education organization calling on Goldberg to educate herself and others. Well, I'm a daughter of Holocaust survivors, um, so I'm very sensitive to all this. This is about understanding what anti-Semitism today looks like and how dangerous it really is and how it's escalating around the country and around the world. We've reached out to representatives for Goldberg, who has identified as Jewish in the past. We haven't heard back. And Nayela Charles joins us now from Los Angeles. Nayela, there, there's been a lot of anti-Semitism in the headlines lately. How does this play into the reaction that we're hearing to, to Goldberg's comments? Yeah, Aaron, just to be clear, the woman I spoke to from Stand With Us didn't categorize Goldberg's words as anti-Semitic, but she did say they are careless. She says what Goldberg said feels like she is minimizing the Holocaust and that it could create a dangerous precedent. Aaron. Nayela Charles with us, with us tonight in L.A. Nayela, thank you. Back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin with the investigation into a murder-suicide at, at a Jehovah's Witness hall in Colorado. Police say the bodies of a married couple were found inside that hall near Denver on Christmas Day. Authorities also found explosives. They were disabled. Police say the two were former members of that congregation. No one else was hurt. Legendary UFC fighter Stefan Bonner has died at the age of 45. The UFC says the Hall of Famer died of a presumed heart complication while at work. The Indiana native helped popularize the sport in 2005 in the first season of the Ultimate Fighter reality show. He finished his seven-year career in 2014 with a record of 17 and 9. West Point Military Academy will begin removing 13 Confederate monuments over the winter break. Those items include a portrait and a bust of Confederate General Robert E. Lee and a bronze plaque that features a hooded figure with the words Ku Klux Klan. The changes at West Point were approved by Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin in October. And today marks the official start of Kwanzaa. The seven-day celebration was created in 1966 to honor Pan-African and African-American history and culture. It's defined by seven communitarian principles, and each day is celebrated by lighting a candle on a seven-branched candle holder called a canara. Families in Jackson, Mississippi, spent the holiday weekend under a boil water advisory again. The EPA is investigating the city, which has been grappling with water quality issues for years. NBC's Blaine Alexander has details. Down south, where temperatures rarely dip this low, the bitter cold is taking a toll on the water system. In city after city, pipes snapping, leaking, and leaving thousands without running water. At South Carolina's largest food bank, a burst pipe threatened the food supply for thousands. Water forced Atlanta's busy airport to temporarily close a gate. The issue spanned from Memphis to Selma to Jackson, Mississippi, a city long plagued by water problems. There, officials issued a boil water alert on Christmas Day. Were you able to cook Christmas dinner? No. It was very disappointing. Katisha Bragg has already been without water five times this year. That means spending her days waiting in line for cases of bottled water. It takes a bottle of water just, you know, to wash your hands. So then brush your teeth. That's another bottle of water. So those cases are gone in a day, and then you have to go back and do the whole thing all over again the next day? Yes. In a statement today, city officials say we continue to struggle to return pressure, citing significant leaks in the system that we have yet to identify. Jackson's water crisis stretches back decades. Over the summer, residents spent months without clean water. Last week, Congress approved $600 million to help Jackson's infrastructure, though some leaders say a meaningful fix will take years. Katisha says she is willing to wait. So I'm, I'm hopeful. It's frustrating. But this is where I choose to be. 
Lane Alexander, NBC News. Continuing our coverage now of that historic Buffalo blizzard and another story of incredible kindness. Nine tourists far from home stranded in the middle of the storm. They ended up riding it out with some welcoming strangers. Here's NBC's Jesse Kirsch. With a historic blizzard bearing down, Alex and Andrea Campagna heard a knock at their door, discovering this bus stuck in the snow, carrying nine South Korean tourists and their driver hoping to reach Niagara Falls on Friday. I could not see this bus, but I did see the stream of people approaching our house. So when, when you see 10 strangers coming your way, there's no time to really debate that. You know you want to get them inside. Yes, that's right. Socks, blankets, uh, anything that we could do to warm them up. The companion is taking on temporary roommates for two nights, offering accommodations from a guest bedroom to sleeping bags for guests including Yosef Choi on his honeymoon. We never experienced the high of, you know, the height of snow. We didn't know, you know, we were going to die, you know, if we didn't meet Alex and Andrea. It's really sobering thought. The real heroes are the ones out on the streets rescuing stranded people. Thankfully, Fans. staying safe inside, fast friends bonding over Korean cooking and the Buffalo Bills before the surprise guests left Christmas Day. Choi hoping to repay the kindness down the road. I can describe in a word, you know, um, it's like, you know, I met angels, you know, and they are like Samar Samaritans, you know. They made my honeymoon so great and, you know, like unforgettable. Turning what could have been a holiday weekend away from loved ones into a Christmas spent with family after all. Jesse Kirsch, NBC News. It's nice to see there are still good people in the world. We want to turn now to Chicago, where an after-school program is helping kids open up about mental health. The program created amid a mental health epidemic among children and teens. NBC's Hallie Jackson sat down with the Surgeon General to talk about that program and the ongoing crisis. For high schoolers in Chicago, a different kind of class. This after-school program centering on the mental health of teens. What a lot of people do is they cover it up. Latrell Scott, who's 17, says adults sometimes don't get it. In my experience as a teenager, it, they have quite literally shunned me, like shunned my emotional state sometimes. And it's taken a lot of work to actually learn how to speak and be honest and open with myself. Nearly half of high schoolers have reported feeling persistently sad or hopeless in the past year. Startling statistics that only begin to illuminate how deep the teen mental health crisis is in this country. It's why programs like this one exist, a partnership between Adler University and After School Matters, intended to help students connect with therapists and get access to behavioral health services. The teens now are so much braver. Um, I think they are demonstrating more openness to talk about their mental health. The nation's top doctor visiting to see for himself earlier this month. Mental health is the defining public health challenge of our time. Should there be more investment in programs like these then? Is that the answer? Well, it's part of the answer. And yes, there should be more investment there because when kids do better, it doesn't just benefit their mental health. It doesn't just reduce uh, chances of anxiety and depression. But it also improves how they perform in school. It improves how they show up for their family and their friends. For Dr. Vivek Morthy, like for so many of us, it's deeply personal. In my own life as a child, I struggled a lot uh, with my mental health. I you know, felt lonely at times. I struggled with anxiety. But I didn't know who to talk to about it. And I felt this real sense of shame. And I look at my own children now, who are four and six, and I don't want them to go through what I went through. I want them to to know that if they need help, that it's okay to ask for help. The Surgeon General sounding the alarm, issuing a rare public health advisory about the youth mental health crisis, and he's been working to elevate the conversation. Just talking about it can be part of the solution, right? Raising the visibility, putting a spotlight on this matters. It absolutely does. And we know that, you know, we've got to change culture by, by having better conversations, more open conversations about mental health. Conversations like the ones happening in Chicago, where nearly eight in 10 students who participated said they feel more hopeful about their future. If I want my life to get any better, then what can I start doing? Like 14-year-old Claudine Agassana. If I'm really feeling down and I need someone to talk to, I have to go and talk to someone to make myself better. More conversations mean stronger connections, mean better health. Hallie Jackson, NBC News, Washington.
Now to top stories, Global Watch and the death toll rising after a Christmas Eve bus crash in northwest Spain. Officials announcing today a seventh person has died after that bus plummeted 100 feet off a bridge into a river below. Two survivors, including the driver, were also injured. It's still unclear what caused that crash, but authorities say bad weather was likely a factor. And in South Korea, tensions stoked after North Korea flew a drone into South Korean airspace. South Korea responding with warning shots and scrambling fighter jets, also launching more surveillance along its border with North Korea. This is the first time in five years North Korean drones violated South Korean airspace. This comes after North Korea launched several ballistic missile tests last week. And in Austria, a group of tourists rescued after a Christmas Day avalanche. That avalanche sweeping down a mountain popular with skiers, at least 10 people initially were feared dead, but they all were found alive after several hours. Four of them were hurt. They are expected to survive. What is in here? Oh, come on. I, I knitted it for you. An oven mitt? Okay. So Phyllis is basically saying, hey, Michael, I know you did a lot to help the office this year, but I only care about you a homemade oven mitt's worth. I gave Ryan an iPod. <laughs> so much for the thought that counts, right? That was a clip from the office after a secret Santa gone wrong there. And, and, and if you received a gift you didn't really want this year, you're not alone. According to the National Retail Federation, there will be more than $171 billion in estimated holiday gift returns. And while you're swapping out those gifts, you want to keep an eye out for some major post-holiday deals, too. Let's bring in smart shopping expert at TrueTrade.com, Trey Baj. Trey, we appreciate you being here tonight. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. You know, I want to get right into the, the best deals first here, right? So where should people be shopping for the biggest discounts today and, and on into the new year? Yeah, so I'm seeing some major discounts right now. So if you do happen to have a need to go back to the store, if you have some gift cards to spend or returns to make, you will find deep, deep discounts. Um, so, for example, for all around sales, I would take a look at Target, uh, who I work with. They have the Target clearance run with savings on thousands of items, including up to 50 percent off sleepwear, clothing, shoes, toys, beauty, uh, jewelry and accessories. And then another favorite category of my Mine are apparel and footwear. So I'm seeing up to 70% off from brands like Madewell and Chico's, up to 50% off at Nordstrom on brands like Ugg and North Face. So that's specifically in the outerwear category. And then Zappos is having a massive winter clearance event. And then the other category that I really like right now are home deals. So up to 60% off at Wayfair, up to 40% off Home Depot. And Ikea is having a huge, massive winter sale. And I would say, if you are going into stores right now, you're going to see these great sales, but you can save even more by using a coupon app. So I would say download Coupon Cabins app, for example. They will have in-store coupons that you can clip and apply at checkout that will help you save even more on top of these retailer sales. Yeah, I appreciate you mentioning that. It's always been something I've had a hard time with. You know, we don't clip coupons anymore, but the apps that are out there, you've really got to get down to, to understanding how those work. So I do want to ask you before we let you go, uh, if, if you are someone who, who got a gift of something that maybe you already have or something that doesn't really fit into your life at the moment, what are your best tips for, for making returns? Yeah, so a couple things here. So first of all, if you are planning to return this week, you will find crowds. A lot of people will be returning like that stat that you just provided. We will see a lot of foot traffic in the stores. And so you can certainly go in those stores and take advantage of those sales. But if you want to avoid the crowds, you could consider returning, say, the first week of January. You'll still be within the window of returning. And then a couple things additionally. So first of all, if you're planning to return uh, online, if you're planning to ship those gifts back, you might find a couple of usual unusual things. Some retailers, because it's very expensive to accept returns. Some retailers may say, oh, just keep it. I'm just going to give you a credit. So that would be like the good side of this. The other side is that you may end up paying a restocking fee or have to pay a return shipping fee as well. So just prepare yourself for that. I would also say that if you're going to return in store or online, make sure that those goods are in as sellable condition as possible. So tags on or with the item in the box with the interior and exterior uh, packaging intact. And then if you have a gift receipt, bring it because that process will be much easier for you and you'll get full value of that gift. 
All right, Trey Bodge, we appreciate you uh, making some time and uh, having some really great advice for folks who are uh, going to be doing a lot of shopping even after Christmas here. Thank you. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.